Uh, hello, uh, everyone, and welcome to the uh, second seminar of the NCC Automation Seminar Series. <clears throat> uh, I would like first to thank uh, Professor Joanna Matthew uh, for uh, the presentation today. Uh, before listening to the presentation, uh, I would like to say uh, a few words uh, for introducing our speaker, although uh, she is uh, perhaps known to many of you as she has already spent some time in ETH Zurich. So uh, uh, Professor Matthew uh, is currently an associate professor of electrical engineering and uh, computer science at the University of Michigan. Uh, before joining the University of Michigan in 2014, she was a postdoctoral researcher at ETH Zurich. Uh, she uh, received her PhD and uh, master's degrees from the University of California, Berkeley uh, in 2012 and 2008, respectively. And she received her uh, bachelor degree from uh, MIT in 2004. Uh, her works uh, are actually, uh, her, uh, her uh, research interests uh, mainly include uh, electric power systems and uh, distributed uh, renewable energy sources uh, and uh, other topics around these two major topics. So uh, thank you again, uh, Joanna, and uh, we uh, very much look forward for your presentation. Great, thank you. You can hear me okay? Okay. Yes, yes we hear you, yeah. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Um, and thank you very much for the invitation to speak. I'm very sad not to be in Switzerland in person, um, but this is the next best thing. <laughs> and I hear you've already had um, several folks from Michigan coming to speak. Now, last week you had my colleague Najmi Ose, and we also collaborate on a project, so it was neat that you're um, involving us in Michigan. <laughs> Michigan's not as beautiful as Switzerland. Um, <laughs> so today I'm gonna tell you about managing uncertainty and coupled power and water distribution networks. It's a joint work with my student, Anna Stuhlmacher, um, and it's supported by a few different uh, US National Science Foundation grants. Okay, so um, the motivation of, of our work and the work that I'm sort of pivoting into um, these days is uh, optimization and control of coupled infrastructure networks to improve reliability and resilience of these networks. So there's been some significant work on um, modeling and optimizing and controlling power and natural gas networks, and also power and transportation networks, especially with electric vehicles. Um, but what I'll talk about here is power and water networks. So the water network requires a lot of different energy for extraction, treatment, and distribution. Um, and the power network also requires a lot of water for cooling, emission scrubbing, fuel extraction, and processing. So these networks are highly interdependent. And there's been some work in this space, of course, and I'll tell you a little bit about that and where our work fits in. Um, in a, almost, uh, yeah, eight years ago now, um, the US Department of Energy decided this was a very important topic in the US and started outlining the challenges and opportunities at this space that they called the water energy nexus. <laughs> and there's still conferences where there'll be sessions on the water energy nexus, so the interplay of these two um, infrastructure systems. And, in certain environments, these things are even more coupled. Of course, in Switzerland, hydropower um, is sort of the linkage between water and energy and managing hydropower resources, of course. Um, in places like California, there's a stronger interdependence because water is pumped from very far away to population centers. And so the state of California uses a tremendous amount of energy to pump water around the state. Um, uh, and then they also use a lot of water in the, in, for, for energy, basically for cooling power plants and so forth. So here I'm gonna specifically talk about water and power distribution networks. Um, and what I mean by water distribution network is the drinking water distribution network. Um, and the power distribution network is of course the network that you think of in distributing power through the lines down your streets. Um, there's a lot of operational challenges associated with both of these types of networks. There's increasing water demand. There's in some places increasing energy demand. There's increasing levels of distributed energy resources, which change power flows and power distribution networks. And so we're looking for more flexibility to support distributed energy resources. Um, and importantly, there's also major concerns about reliability and resilience of both of these sorts of networks. Um, we recently in Michigan <laughs> experienced extreme um, cases of 
poor reliability and resilience of these networks with power outages that lasted multiple days because of windstorms that came through, that took down trees, that then took down power lines. My house was out of power for three days. Um, and together with that, we've been seeing a lot of flooding. It's been happening here. It's also been happening, as you know, in Europe, significant flooding from bursts of rain that take out infrastructure systems um, that show that these networks are even more coupled than we previously um, thought. So the question is, how can we better operate these networks to prove reliability and resilience? But how can we also just operate them to decrease capital and operational costs and make them better utilize the infrastructure that we have now? And so here, what I'm showing you is a one-line diagram of a power distribution network. This is just the IEEE 13 bus network. And here's one of the typical water distribution networks that um, people play around with. And the coupling that I'm showing explicitly here is the pumps that exist on different buses in the power distribution network. Um, and the pumps are pumping from reservoirs and then they may fill a tank. Um, and then the water would go around and feed the demand in the network. Um, so this is the type of coupling, the extracted view of the coupling that I'll talk about here. So disclaimer, I'm not a water network expert. <laughs> We've talked to a lot of people who are in um, formulating these problems and understanding how to, how to solve these sorts of problems. But I naturally think about these problems from the perspective of the power system because that's the field I come from. So I'll sort of talk to you about it in that sense. Um, but I guess that's probably more aligned with most of your backgrounds as well. So maybe that won't be so um, much of a stretch. <laughs> so the overall goal of our work is to increase flexibility in these networks. And so we're looking to water networks to increase flexibility in the power network. Um, just some motivation, probably many of you have seen plots like this before. Um, here's some data from Australia that's showing um, wind power production um, over the course of a day and over the course of two weeks and just showing the amount of variability that exists in these um, wind power uh, farms and how it's very hard for the power system to integrate resources like that look like this. Um, this is a figure that I've been using for a while in my talks just to motivate how hard solar is to integrate because you can see there's this general trend of solar power production over the course of a day um, in Arizona, but every time a cloud goes by there's these huge dips in production, which again is hard for the power system to integrate. Um, so there's different ways we can try to integrate these sorts of resources and increase um, flexibility in the network. And one of the problems I work on quite a bit um, is what we call non-disruptive load control. So it's about controlling or coordinating resources in the network, like refrigerators, air conditioners, um, water heaters. I'm sorry, this is showing up as very pixelated on my screen and maybe it is on yours too. It wasn't before I blew it up here, <laughs> but um, Hopefully you can still see the gist of what's going on, but here we're trying to control different types of loads with the controller to control their power consumption to track a trajectory. So if they weren't being controlled, they would generally consume power according to the blue line. Instead, I'm going to send them a balancing signal, the black line, and have them try to track that as well as possible, which is shown with the red line. So what you can imagine is you can put any different type of load here that has some flexibility um, in your controller and try to coordinate them. Um, my past work has very much leveraged um, loads like thermostatically controlled loads, specifically air conditioners. Um, right now we're doing a demonstration project in Texas to show that an aggregation of air conditioners can provide frequency regulation. Um, and to do that, we leverage different tools and techniques from control estimation, learning, and optimization. Um, and so now I'm trying to sort of expand my research to look out at what other types of loads would be good. And so today we're going to remove these thermostatic loads and put in water pumps. Um, so there's lots of different sources of flexibility, like I mentioned, thermostatically controlled loads. You can also use industrial loads and commercial loads, the commercial buildings, HVAC control. Um, industrial loads, for instance, aluminum smelting. Um, we can change when uh, those processes consume power. Um, we can, of course, use batteries. Um, and then electric vehicles, specifically the batteries in the electric vehicles. Um, we can also control renewables, specifically decide when to curtail them. So these all offer a variety of different sources of flexibility. And I'm sure many of you on this call are working on different aspects of these different devices. Um, one of the, I think, more overlooked sectors is the water sector. So um, there has been a bunch of work though on using agricultural pumps to provide flexibility to the network. So th this is a study in, about California. So basically using agricultural pumping, which consumes a huge amount of energy in California to shift demand to respond to um, different signals from the power system operator. So in some cases, these pumps can provide services, the same services that generators provide by participating in the California independent system operator markets. Also wastewater treatment. So basically choosing when to treat the water and how much energy goes into those treatment processes, shifting that over time. So wastewater can also be used. 
um, as a, a source of flexibility. So in terms of drinking water pumping, um, drinking water and wastewater networks in the US consume 4% of the electricity used in the US. So it's not a huge fraction, but different parts of the country, it, it's more or less, it sort of depends on the availability of the resource. So in a place like California, it's much higher. Um, and in a place with a, a lot of water resource like Michigan, it's lower. Um, so uh, the majority of that consumption though comes from the water pumps themselves. So, and the nice thing is those water pumps are controllable and they already have infrastructure in place to be able to control their, their um, flow levels and so forth. So there has been some work on optimal water and power flow types problems. We are trying to co-optimize both systems. Um, so formulation and, and solution approaches were developed recently in this Cohen's paper. Um, and, then, and then these are folks from um, NREL and Toronto that worked on this work. And um, there's also been papers that looked at relaxing and approximating the optimization problems, which are usually highly complex um, and non-convex, non um, non-linear sort of constraints. Um, and people have looked at using these types of um, models for demand response as well. This, this paper in particular looked at irrigation pumping, not drinking water pumping. A lot of the models are similar across these different um, systems. So um, in terms of leveraging water network flexibility, there's been work on um, having uh, basically setting up so water networks can respond to power network signals to increase consumption when there's an overproduction of power from renewables. Um, and then this last paper here looked at cases where you have multiple water distribution networks that are located across um, a large scale power transmission system providing support to that transmission system. So this is sort of the existing work, um, but in all of these references, water and power demand are assumed known. They're not treated as uncertain. And as you know, um, demand is inherently uncertain. And so we generally have to deal with that when we solve these sorts of problems. So when we consider uncertainty in water and power networks, um, we know that demand, water demand at different nodes, that's your household faucets, for instance, is uncertain. Um, at least from the perspective of the uh, water network operator, it's not known in advance. Um, and then we also know that net demand at all the buses in the network is uncertain. And so when I say net demand, I mean um, the actual demand minus renewables production. So how do we then leverage the water distribution network, given that that network has uncertainty, to support the power distribution network, which also has uncertainty? <laughs> um, and so what we've been doing for the past few years with my student, um, Anna, is sort of building up this formulation. So we had a very initial paper where we just looked at water demand uncertainty, a subsequent follow-up that looked at power demand uncertainty that we presented at the last PSCC. Um, and then we wrapped all of that up in this paper, which is primarily what I'm gonna focus my talk on today, um, which is a chance constrained programming approach to manage water and power demand uncertainty together um, in distribution networks. So what does the formulation look like? So we're gonna formulate an optimization problem, um, but that optimization problem is gonna not only design a schedule, but design um, real-time control policies to compensate for uncertainty that you only see in real time. So we'll use the water network's flexibility to support the power distribution network. The hard part about this problem is that the constraints are non-convex and that there's uncertainty from both networks. Um, so it'll be a chance constraint optimization problem where we'll include constraints of both networks, the power on the water network, um, and then we'll model the uncertainty in water and power demand. And the result is to get a water pumping schedule um, that satisfies all the constraints plus control policy parameters where we're assuming control policies are affine um, in the uncertainty that will allow the system to respond to real-time um, mismatch between the forecasted water demand and the forecasted power demand and the actuals. So that's the way this works. So if you've worked on chance constraint optimal power flow, this is sort of augmenting that approach um, to include the water network, um, but also solving the problem for a distribution network instead of the full transmission network. So we're mainly looking at voltage violations in distribution networks instead of matching supply and demand at a transmission network. So that's how it sort of relates to a lot of the work in this space. So um, in terms of the water distribution network, this is the part <laughs> we had to learn um, because we weren't experienced in water distribution networks before we got started in this. Um, so the, just gonna give you sort of a high level overview of it instead of presenting every single constraint because they get very messy very fast. Um, and they're also nonlinear and non-convex in general. Um, so we, it, the water distribution network is characterized by the hydraulic head, um, 
And the head you can sort of think of as comparable to something like voltage. You need to bound it between two different points, um, two different levels to make sure that there's sufficient head in the network so that water flows downhill and there's sufficient water pressure at your, um, at your faucets. And also it's characterized by the volumetric flow rate. So how much flow is going through the pumps and the pipes and the valves and the tanks and everything. Um, so we have to bound the hydraulic head, the, fl the flow rates, and also the tank levels, the water tank levels. Um, it's, it's common in the US to use um, tanks to sort of you pump the water up um, in the tank at night and then you sort of let it go down during the day. And these tanks store water, but they're also essential for ensuring that there's sufficient pressure in the network um, so that the water, again, flows downhill and has pressure when it comes out of your faucet. So th that's a common sort of setup. Um, and since these network equations are complex, we end up using some convex approximations. Um, this one we didn't develop ourselves, but we approximate the pump head um, and flow performance curve using an approximation from this paper here um, at the bottom of the screen. That was from MIT. Um, and then we also use some convex relation, uh, relaxation, sorry, um, specifically approximate um, some of the functions with, for instance, their convex hulls and so forth. And we will explore at the end what these approximations and relaxations do to our solutions, but we find in general they're pretty reasonable um, things to do for the problem and they don't um, change the solution too much. So um, we assume for the power distribution network that we have a radial power distribution network typical in the US and we need to bound the, the voltages of all the buses in the network. Um, and we're going to use a linearized three phase unbalanced flow approximation. So in the US, it ends up being more important <laughs> to capture the unbalance in the network, um, but then, uh, then to capture the, the, the nonlinearity um, because of the way the networks are usually, the distribution networks are usually significantly, or not significantly unbalanced, but the unbalance matters enough that it changes the voltages enough that you have to capture that. Um, the linearization, linearizes things like the loss terms and so forth. Um, but uh, you can approximate those and get a pretty decent um, approximation for most types of networks. And again, we're gonna explore what this uh, approximation does to our solution at the end of the talk. So in this particular case, we're avoiding the loss term completely, although we've explored other cases where we introduce it, but we, we sort of have a linear loss formulation um, that's approximated, so. So how do we handle water demand uncertainty? Um, we model water demand forecast errors. So the difference between our forecast for how much demand there is at each of the nodes in the network and the actual demand at each of the nodes in the network with this D tilde. And then we develop um, control policies to compensate for water demand forecast error um, by adjusting the pumping. So we're specifying the form of these control policies in advance to make sure that we have a problem that in the end is solvable. Um, but by specifying the form of the policy, of course, we're restricting um, the possible options for what that policy could be. So um, we're not sort of giving us, giving ourselves um, the ability to come up with a more complex policy that could lead to a better solution overall. Um, but this is a simple way to formulate it. And it, it, this sort of a common, common approach of choosing an affine control policy. So we're optimizing over the parameter. So in the policy, but we're specifying its form. So the pumps compensate um, the total forecast error um, where this parameter, so this is the total forecast error, it's summed over all the different nodes in the network. And this parameter here is a decision variable. So we choose how much each pump should compensate the, the forecast error at each of the nodes, um, or uh, the total forecast error across all the nodes. Um, and then this is how their flow rate changes when they compensate that forecast error. So this is a change that'll happen in real time. The tanks themselves are passive. So there's the water tanks that are storing the water. So the tanks have to ensure that water um, balance is always met so that there's always all the, all the water that's demanded is supplied by the network. And so the tanks just basically respond to ensure balance for the network. So the pumps are controlled by the control policy parameter and the tanks just respond. Um, so that's how this is set up. And then the total response from all these different resources has to equal one, which normalizes the parameters such that the total um, supply demand mismatch for the water is, is met. So in terms of power demand uncertainty, um, we model power demand forecast error with this random variable row. Um, so there's an uncertainty at every bus and every phase because we have a three phase unbalanced network. So there's three times the number of buses um, and, and that's the number of forecasters that we consider in the network for power. 
And this is a corrective control policy that basically adjusts the pumps um, based on the forecast error that you realize in real time, based on the actual demand and what you would forecast it to be. Um, and we only want to compensate actions that cause voltage violations in our uh, distribution network. So the idea here, I think it's easiest to see over here, is that if your voltage is sort of fluctuating here in the middle um, between a, an upper voltage and a lower voltage, you don't need a control policy. It's allowed to fluctuate. Um, so this policy isn't about balancing like the water one. This is about just mitigating uh, violations. So as soon as you go above the max or below the min, you have to apply the control policy to push your system back into the space to ensure that the voltages are satisfied in the power distribution network. And that's encoded here with this binary S, which is only one if there's actually a violation of the limits and zero otherwise. And then the, the policy takes on this form where the C is the parameters uh, vector, and then the row is the uncertainty. And then these are vectors across all of the different, like row is the vector across all the different buses and phases. Okay, so what does the overall optimization problem looks, look like? This is I, this is a first slide to set it up, but then I'll show you kind of like the second, the second slide will show you the actual formulation. So here we're minimizing the cost of the scheduled water network operation. So basically minimizing the pumping costs where the pumps are located at different buses. Um, and then we're also minimizing something we're calling a flexibility cost, which is related to how much the pumps have to adjust in real time to compensate forecast error. Um, so the first one is the schedule, the second is the flexibility. And then X is the decision variable vector. It includes um, different variables for the water network, so the hydraulic heads and flow rates, the power network, um, real and reactive power flow, pump power, uh, bus voltage. And then we're also choosing these control policy parameters for the water control policy and the power control policy. So the pumps are responding to make sure that water is balanced and also that there's no voltage violations. And there's two parts of each policy um, for each pump just to make sure both of those things can happen in real time. So that's sort of describing the objective function and the, the variables, the decision variables. Um, and then the optimization problem looks like this. So we're solving for the pump operation and the control policy parameters subject to constraints that encode all the water network and power network equations. So those are the equations I mentioned before for power flow and also water flow. And then we have a chance constraint that takes into um, it all of the different um, inequality constraints that include uncertainty from the power network or the water network. And that constraint has to hold the probability of at least one minus epsilon. Okay, so the solution approach. So we're using the, we initially decided to use the, sort of the simple, the simplest to implement version of an approach to solve this type of problem. Um, when I was a postdoc at ETH, lots of people were using this type of approach, the scenario approach for chance constrained problems. Um, and it often is a good starting point because it gives you some nice intuition <laughs> for how the system behaves. Um, but the idea is that uh, you should observe a very large number of scenarios um, and in order for that chance constraint to hold um, at that probability level that you want, you have to select a certain number of scenarios and make sure all the constraints are satisfied for all of those scenarios. And the, the, the choice of the, the number of scenarios that you have to pick is here, where epsilon is that um, constraint violation level and the chance constraint, and you choose that. Um, this is a confidence um, parameter psi. Um, and then delta is related to the number of uh, variables in your problem. So you choose this number of scenarios, you then observe this many random scenarios, you make sure the constraints hold for all of these, and then you have some probabilistic guarantees that um, your chance constraint will be satisfied. Um, it's pros and cons. Um, advantages, it, you can use it to jointly enforce your chance constraints instead of enforcing them each separately. Um, it doesn't require that you know anything about the uncertainty distribution. So you can, you can, if you know nothing about the uncertainty characteristics in your problem, you can use an approach like this. But it does assume that you have access to a lot of different scenarios, a lot of data showing mismatches between supply and demand um, of both the water and the power network in our case. Um, it's conservative in practice because it doesn't place any restrictions on your uncertainty distributions. Any distribution that has the, that, that, that data could be generated from. Um, is considered a viable um, distribution, so it has to be probabilistically robust for those. Um, and there's been a lot of work here on how to select the right number of scenarios. For this specific rule of how, how many scenarios to pick, this applies only to convex problems. There have been extensions um, that have looked at 
non if you if you have non-convexity and that non-convexity is structured in certain ways, how you can change the number of scenarios you have to select to still get probabilistic guarantees. Um, but for this case, this is for the convex problems. Um, so that's what we decided to use. I'll talk a little bit about at the end about how um, we've recently moved away from this approach to consider um, an adjustable robust approach that reduces data that you need. <laughs> it doesn't require data, um, but makes the problem more conservative, but more computationally tractable. So there's a lot of different solution approaches in this space that maybe you're aware of. Um, in order, so in order to use that, I already mentioned that the problem has to be convex. Um, if you're going to choose that number of scenarios reflected in that paper that I showed in the past, the California Campion Prending E paper. So um, if in our problem, we have this binary variable because the voltage control policy should only be used when you actually violate a limit. So what we're going to do here is just remove that binary variable, which means that we're going to always apply the voltage control policy. So that means we're always going to be adjusting the pumps in response to um, uh, a power demand forecast errors, um, even if we need it. Uh, I mean, even if we don't need it. So if we need it or we don't need it, we're going to be applying that control policy. So that means even when the voltage is fine, we're going to be sort of adjusting things up and down to try to better get the system to align with our forecast instead of the actual. So that means using more control um, in our system, but still um, satisfying the constraints in the network because it's still going to be trying to move a system away from violations, uh, voltage violations. It's just going to be using the policy more. That said, in practice, you could choose not to apply the policy when you don't need to, because you'll see if you're violating your limits and you can choose to not apply the control policy. Um, but the policy won't be optimal for the case when you choose not to apply it. <laughs> It'll be optimal for the case when it's always applied, um, because that's what the model says. It's going to always be applied. Um, so pros and cons there. But so what, when we remove this variable, we transform our mixed integer convex problem into a quadratically constrained convex problem. Um, and we need less scenarios for the, the scenario approach, uh, for, for a convex version of the scenario approach versus a mixed integer version of the scenario approach. So it's faster to solve. Um, and here's the comparison of the solve time and you can just see the huge difference, right? So here's the solve time when we have the mixed integer version. Here's the solve time when we have the convex problem. Problem. Okay, so huge difference that these are in seconds, right? So less than a second versus a huge number of seconds. <laughs> so it makes sense to do it, uh, but we're giving up a little optimality. Um, so, uh, and then the second part of the objective function was how we how do we model um, flexibility costs? So the objective function looks like this, where this is the cost of the schedule. And then these are the costs of the flexibility. This is the flexibility that the water that we're giving to the water network to, to balance um, the water demand and supply. And then this is the flexibility we're giving to the power network to um, help with uh, over and under voltages. So it's not clear how to model this. Um, in a power network, if you model the flexibility for generators that are going to ramp up and down to mitigate supply demand mismatch in the power network, um, that's reserves, right? So we have reserve capacity, we reserve some amount, and we usually pay, in the US anyway, we usually pay generators as a function of the capacity they've reserved to provide that sort of resource. Um, and that might make sense here too, to pay the pump owners the, the capacity that they've reserved. Um, but it's, it's not quite the same cost benefit. Usually the pumps aren't participating in the markets. Otherwise, it's not clear what else they would do with that capacity. Does that capacity have value? Does it have as much value as generator capacity? So we asked these sorts of questions and we came up with a variety of different options for how to model, model the flexibility costs of these resources. So in the first case, we did the simplest thing we could think of is we're just saying the flexibility is related to those control policy parameters. And so we're using the norm squared of the control policy parameters. So if there's more a higher control policy parameter, it means they're going to give a larger response when there's a um, supply demand um, mismatch uh, or a voltage violation. And so um, that should cost more. And then in this one, it's more in line with what I talked about for generators, where we're going to say that the cost of providing flexibility is a function of the range that you'll reserve to provide flexibility. But we're going to define that range in terms of the pump flow rate adjustment. So how much the flow rate of the pumps can adjust. So they have a schedule and then plus or minus some flow rate adjustment that's going to be um, lead to the cost. And we also considered another case 
where we define the adjustment range in terms of the power adjustment. So how much the power could change at the pumps. Um, it doesn't work as well. It introduces some extra nonlinearities and, and messes up our problem. So I'm not going to go into that one too much, but that was the most natural one for us to think of in the first place. So in our case studies in our paper, we consider a variety of different scenarios and then explore the different solutions. And you can see here, um, we're considering multi-period problems in B and C. So we have three different cases. In B and C, we have um, uh, three different periods we're considering. We multiply the water and power demand by different values to, to look at what's happening to the system as demand increases over time in the water or power network or decreases. And then this is the number of scenarios required to solve each of these problems, um, which is based on the number of decision variables um, in the problem. Okay, so it shows you we need a whole lot of scenarios. Is this realistic? It's not clear. Um, and then what we did was we didn't actually have data from water networks, for instance, and so we randomly generated a whole lot of data to do our analysis. And so our results are um, sort, of, sort of subject to our assumptions of the data that we generated. Um, so if you use different distributions, you would get some different answers just to keep that in mind. Um, and then we evaluated the reliability of our solution, which means um, we get a solution and then in real time we implement um, the solution together with the schedule together with the control policy and see if any, any of the constraints are violated for different possible um, uncertainty realizations. And if any constraints violated, the solution fails um, and that solution is not, not considered reliable. And we use the same networks I showed you at the beginning, the IEEE 13 bus network and then this water distribution system here with two pumps and a tank. So what do the results look like? So just showing you the multi-period cases, so case B and C. So case B just had a high constant demand and case C had a decreasing demand. Um, and here is the, the dashed red lines are the, the, the schedule you obtain if you just solve a deterministic problem and don't have the pumps change their output based on uncertainty. And so it gives you some kind of baseline to know that the pumps are changing their operation when you consider uncertainty in the control policies. And then the, um, the blue lines are showing you when we solve the problem with the uncertainty and use the, the scenario parts, here's the schedule. So this pump decreases its um, consumption. This one increases its consumption and the tank is about the same. Um, but in this case, when we have decreasing demand, we generally need to decrease uh, over this time period. So these two end up decreasing and this increases a little over time. And then on top of this, I'm showing you the region that's reserved to provide um, to provide adjustments of the pumps to help the water network or the power network. And so the light one, the light blue is the power network. So this is the, the light blue is the region reserved to basically mitigate voltage violations. And the dark blue is the region reserved to make sure water is balanced across the network so that the, the supply of the water and the demand of the water match. And you can see here when the demand is high but constant, these um, flexibility regions are quite large and they vary a little over time, but they're fairly large and big. Um, and then for um, this part over here, when you have the demand decreasing over these hours, um, it constrains the amount of flexibility you can provide because the network is sort of trying to um, match the demand more than it can provide flexibility. So here in case B, we're having spatial shifting from pump one to pump two, and there's still significant flexibility in the network um, to provide for the policies. And then here we have temporal shifting to manage the decreasing demand, but we have less flexibility overall offered to the system. So this just gives you some intuition for the types of results you can get from these problems and how much flexibility you may lose, for instance, if you have to do temporal shifting. Um, and so what is the corrective control policy that's helping out with the power network do? Um, this plot is showing you over the different buses and phases in the network, I should say buses, um, <laughs> what the scheduled voltages are and the corrective voltages are. So the scheduled means what the voltages would be if we just used the scheduled water pumping. The corrected is what the voltages are once you correct them using the control policy parameters and the control law. Um, and so, and there's multiple values at each um, because we have a, this three phase network. Okay, so there's a three phase network. So, like, I, I don't know which one was A, B, and C, but A, B, and C, for instance, um, at each of the different buses. So, they each have three different voltage magnitudes at each of the different buses. So, that's why there's multiple lines associated with each of these values here for bus. 
Um, and if you zoom in right here to this yellow region, that's what this little plot is over here. And what it's showing you is if we just follow the schedule and don't adjust the pumps, we go outside of the voltage limit down here. And if we do adjust the pumps, we move it up to the blue one. And the worst case is that we're hitting the limit exactly. And so that's what the schedule, that's what the schedule plus the control policy parameter is doing. It's shifting the voltages back into the region, the allowable region. Um, in terms of the flexibility costs, so we ran this type of um, problem for a variety for, for the three different versions of the flexibility costs. And here I'm just showing you two of them instead of that last one that I told you didn't work very well. <laughs> um, different ways of representing the flexibility costs lead to different solver times and pumping schedules. Um, in all cases, what we found is these empirical violations are fine. So here I'm showing you when we take the solution and then run it against the data, um, how often do we actually violate any of the constraints? And we had chosen our empirical violation level to be 5%, and we're getting something much, much less than that, which is showing you again that this approach is incredibly conservative. And our so in our choice of flexibility costs formulation shouldn't affect that those that violation level. And we find, of course, it doesn't. It does change it a little bit. Um, but in any case, either formulation is fine. Um, but the flexibility costs that are shown here aren't directly comparable because they're not in, even in the same units. One is a, the first one was a function of the control policy parameters, and the second was a function of the range of pumping that you're allowing. So these aren't directly comparable. And where we are with this now is it's still not clear to us how to properly represent these flexibility costs. It's really a question for the water engineers who run the, these, these pumping plants to say, what, what, is going to, what is going to incur costs when we're ramping these things up and down in real time? Um, there are obviously like um, issues with you know, ramping things up and down and that's incurring like operational maintenance types costs. Um, wear and tear, loss of lifetime, but what act, what actually leads to like, that cost and how to model that correctly isn't clear to us. We know we can formulate the problem in a variety of different ways, but it's not clear which one's the best one to pick. Um, and so in terms of the overall performance of the solution, um, so the violation probabilities I showed you before, we're testing our solution back on the convexified relaxed network equations, right? So it's, a, it's cheating a bit. It's saying we solve this problem assuming this model, and now we're going to generate a bunch of new uncertainty data and then test it back on that original model. And so in that sense, like the probabilistic guarantees should hold and everything should be fine. It makes sense, right? But we started by making some assumptions, relaxing things, approximating things, and so forth. So what if we take the actual network equations and we see, does the schedule and the control policy ensure that for the actual networks, water and power networks, um, there are no violations? So we did that. Um, and what we found was when we, so the convexify of the system is our, our what I built all the math around. And the original constraints is the non-convex network equations. Um, what we find is we get a lot more voltage violations. So here, um, what I'm showing you is these are the epsilons, the probability that we're trying to um, be less than for the chance constraints. When we test the problem with the convex formulation, we're way less than it, so 0.1 versus 5. But when we use the non-convex um, equations, uh, specifically in this case, the problem is coming from the power flow, the non-convex AC power flow for unbalanced three-phase distribution systems. We get that the violations are about 11%, and we wanted 5 but what we then said was, what's going on? Why is the voltage you know, so bad in these cases? And it turns out it's not bad. <laughs> the voltage is very close to the limit. The average difference between the voltage, the voltage, the worst case voltage we get and the limit is tiny. It's very small. Um, and here you can actually see it. That's the minimum voltage where the voltage limit was 0.95. Um, and then the average voltage in this case here is also very, very close to the limit. So the issue is that the approximation is over approximating the voltages, but the actual voltages are just a tiny bit lower because we're not modeling losses properly. So what does this mean? Um, here's just showing it visually, the convex um, power flow, so the convexified power flow equations versus the non-convex power flow equations. And again, you have one, two, th three, or in some cases, more lines per um, bus. So you have three points for bus 
one, two, or three points for bus, I should say, <laughs> um, because you have each of the phases. Um, but in any case, the important thing to notice is that the non-convex power flow, the full AC power flow equations are a little bit lower. And so that's what we're running into for problems. So we violate those when we apply our solution back to the real system, but it's a tiny violation. So the workaround is if you just adjust the minimum voltage limit by a small amount, you don't see this problem. So you just increase from 0.95 to 0.955. And then this problem goes away for our particular test network. The hard part is then for a generic test network, how do you how do you choose this heuristic workaround? Um, the problem, another problem is chance constraints just give no insight into the magnitude of duration of the constraint violations. Um, right. It's just, is it violated or not? And this is sort of a common complaint about the chance about chance constraints. Of course, there are different formulations where you can take these sorts of things into account. How much do you violate a constraint? How long do you violate the constraint? Those are super important for these types of problems. Um, and another thing we found is when we then looked at uh, in general, our convexified network versus the real network and what was causing problems, we actually find that the water network model that we've convexified is pretty reasonable for this system. Most of the problems we saw when we tested on the real system versus the convexified system, we're in the power network, and it was just this voltage issue. But in the water network, it, it actually worked pretty well. So um, in terms of the pipe head loss, the actual hydraulic heads are actually greater than or equal to the convexified hydraulic heads. And, some heads, and since we're usually at the lower head limit, this is great. Um, so uh, the pump power consumption, the, the relaxation is tight for cases closest to the minimum voltage limit. Um, and so forth. So in, in general, we found that the, the water network convexification wasn't causing major issues and we were generally feasible, although maybe slightly suboptimal for the water network. So we also looked at a case where we tried to simplify the control policy for power. Um, so right now what we're using is the forecast error at every bus and every phase in the network to compute the control response of the pumps. Now, if you think about what that would mean, um, physically, it means that we actually have to have sensors at each of those points saying this is the actual consumption. And though power networks have a lot more sensors now, smart meters and, and PMUs and other sorts of things, you'd have to be transmitting that back to the water system so that they can act on that in real time. Um, and depending on how fast you want to transmit that information and what kind of delays you're willing to tolerate, it might be very cumbersome. Um, moreover, having to act on all of those different pieces of information just makes the problem harder and big, like bigger and therefore harder to solve and take longer. So instead of using all that information, if you could aggregate it up and basically group portions of the network and act on the mismatch in, you know, in, in the, the power for between the power forecast and the, the power actual um, at groups of buses, maybe you could simplify your life. So that's what we did here where we did two different simplifications. So simplification one is we said, let's sum up all the forecast error across the power network in each of these one, two, th three, four regions, and then act on that piece of information instead of on the information from every bus. And then similarly, simplification two further simplifies it to just partition the network into two pieces and act on the forecast error in each of these two pieces. And you can see here what the results look like, but the main takeaways are at the bottom. The simplifications decrease the solver time. You're decreasing the number of decision variables you have. Um, it increases the cost of operating the network. You end up being more conservative. Um, and then it generally decreases the empirical violations. And that's again, because you end up being a little bit more conservative. Um, so, so that's what you have basically are less able to exploit sort of these these edge <laughs> solutions well, where you can act on each tiny piece of information a little bit more optimally <laughs> than if you act on aggregate information. So results make sense, um, but it just some things one could do to simplify this type of problem, which is uh, like um, admittedly not necessarily exactly how you want to implement this. I would argue that what we've done here is sort of a first step towards thinking about if these networks make sense to use for flexibility, but probably what we've done is not directly implementable for a variety of different reasons. So um, in conclusion, um, I was just checking my time. I think I'm okay <laughs> for time. Um, what we found is that temporal and spatial shifting of water networks um, pumping can support the power distribution network. Um, we had to exploit different approximations and relaxations to come up with a tractable problem. The solution ends up being high cost and high reliability. Um, there's definitely something to be said for sort of looking at those trade-offs a little bit more closely to seeing if you get a lower cost solution that meets the reliability objective a little bit more closely because we're much more reliable in terms of the chance constraint violation probability than we need to be. 
Um, we've recently worked on this problem a bunch more because, like I said, computational tractability is an issue. Um, and we formulated a new version uh, with adjust uh, using the ideas from adjustable robust optimization. Um, for this, we're working with Lena Rold from Wisconsin, who is also a former PSL member. It, it uh, significantly improves computational time. Um, it requires water network monotonicity, specifically the hydraulic heads and tank levels are monotonically decreasing across the network. And so our CDC paper spends a lot of uh, space basically showing when that is true, when that's a good assumption, when you can apply monotonicity. So if you make that assumption, you can formulate the problem as an adjustable, robust problem and solve it much, much more quickly. Um, the, the one issue though, is it becomes even more conservative, but it's much faster to solve. Um, and in the future, we're trying to think about um, further improving scalability using larger test networks and longer time horizons. The time horizons I showed you here are only for three periods because that's what was tractable. Um, <laughs> trying to minimize information sharing such that the water network doesn't need to get so much information from both the water, from the downstream water network, basically all of the consumption nodes in the network plus the power network. It's just a lot of information transfer that might not be practical. Um, and we're also currently working on a paper for PSDC um, to look at how you can use the water network to provide multiple services simultaneously. So we'll just support, um, in addition to using the extra capacity that the, that the pumps have, the extra flexibility that you might not be exploiting for the voltage uh, support to also provide things like frequency support and other services. Um, so with that, I'll stop here and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much again for inviting me to speak. Uh, thank you very much, Joanna, for a uh, very nice and interesting presentation. So.